We're running a little bit behind the schedule, so I'm going to try and kind of get this moving because we've got a few people coming in. I know that uh, we're short on chairs. American chairs. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't have a speaker system, so I'm going to try and project that, and hopefully you'll be able to hear me. I know we're very short on chairs, but there are a few seats up here, kind of in an overflow area, if somebody wants to come grab a seat up here. Um, and we've also got a couple of seats up here at the front. So if anyone wants to come on up and take a seat, or you can stand, I guess. Um, actually, if, if uh, everybody would rise, Mike Brooks is going to lead us in the invocation. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can come together as a country. We thank you for each one here as we talk about your business of the Second Amendment and just other issues that are important for this country. We pray that you help us to remember that uh, you gave this wonderful country to us and we just ask that uh, we can protect it and just make sure that uh, we're doing things that you want us to do. And again, thank you for this great nation that you gave us, who we ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. And if you will, please face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. And again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, basically, uh, uh, we're gonna. This is kind of an outline of the agenda. And uh, can everybody in the back hear me? Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Um, so basically, what we're gonna go through is a little bit about the Tea Party, some of the things we're working on. So we'll have about 30 minutes here at the beginning. Um, we've gotten a little bit of a late start, so if you could kind of adjust that uh, for us a little bit. Um, but uh, we're gonna go through a little bit about what the Tea Party is about, some of the things we're working on. And then, of course, uh, I think many of you are here to see the sheriffs from uh, Ted Mink from Jefferson County and Fred Wagner from Park County. They'll be speaking. And then in addition to that, uh, we have Jeff Wright back at the back. He's got a, uh, he's waving his hand back there. Jeff Wright is an author who's just written the book, The Citizen's Last Stand. And he's going to uh, present some information to us for about uh, 15 minutes. And then we'll have uh, about 10 minutes questions and answers for him, too. So what I like to do is kind of talk about what is the Tea Party and what do we stand for. <clears throat> and basically, primarily, you can break it down into two things. We're about individual liberty and limited government. And within those two areas, there are, of course, kind of these subpoints too. But uh, fundamentally, what we're about is individual liberty for people. That involves personal responsibility, of course, and limited government. And that includes fiscal issues and things of that nature. So. Basically here at our Tea Party, we believe that action is more important than words um, and that we need to be proactive. For too long, I think, conservatives, libertarians, liberty movement, they've, we've been reactive. We've let other people set the agenda. And so what this group is about is trying to set the agenda and move it forward. We're, we're tired of following and, try, and uh, being reactive. Um, we also believe that part of that is planning. And um, without planning, whoops. I just lost something. Can you unplug? No, let's see here. The computer's on. Bulb. Is there somebody that could uh, look at this while I keep going? I don't know. Oh, none of us have computers. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, planning is an essential part of that. So um, being proactive also involves planning, looking ahead, and trying to figure out exactly where we're going to go. And um, the bottom line for this group is not talking, it's not education, but it's about winning elections, because ultimately that's where it all counts. If we're not winning elections, we can sit in here, we can all come in here, and we can have great speeches. Um, we can all be educated, but if we don't win elections, then none of that matters. You're going to have to wing it. I'm going to wing it. Oh, I've got it right here on my computer, but <laughs> nobody else can see it. 
Okay. Oh, well, okay. Okay. Very good. So, a couple of things about how we engage people. Um, we're trying to present a positive message here. So, a lot of that is when we're reactive, a lot of it is negative because we're seeing the bad things. So, by being proactive, what we're going to try and do is project a very positive image, a very positive message. We believe that there's a future. Uh, we're not doom and gloom. And uh, then when we approach people, we're going to approach them with a few things in mind. One of them is that first, before we ask anything of you, we're going to invest our time in you. And so um, that, that means that uh, I, I think there has been a history of, uh, on, the, on the right of groups coming together and asking people to vote on election day, and then you never hear from people beyond that. So uh, one of the principles that we believe in is You've got to reach out, you've got to do things for other people before you can ask them to do something for you. And um, we also apply something called the 15-minute principle. And basically what that is, is the belief that almost every single person in this room will, will commit to 15 minutes a month to do something. And, hey, we're back on. Excellent. Has it been on very long? Okay. <laughs> okay. So basically everybody in this room is probably likely to commit to 15 minutes a month to do something. And so what happens a lot of the time is um, that there's people will say, uh, you, you might get an email that says, we'd like for you to contact your legislators. That email says, go to contact your legislator. Well, the first thing you have to do is go look up their information and, and uh, find their email address, find their phone numbers, do all of those things. And we believe that that that's something that we should be doing so that we can get you down to those 15 minute increments. So if we're going to engage you and expect uh, your involvement to change the process, because ultimately this is all about elections, then we need to make things simple for you to be able to engage. So um, the next thing I kind of want to do is run through some announcements. I do have a lot of announcements, different things going on. And um, so I'm going to run through those. At the end of that, anybody who wants to, we have a two-minute announcement section. And uh, so if you have anything you'd like to announce, we do ask that you, especially with this group tonight, kind of keep that limited to less than two minutes if you would. But if you've got a group that's meeting or anything like that, we encourage you to stand up and tell us about it. So um, I've got a lot of people that have really uh, pitched in uh, to pull this meeting together. And um, I'm very thankful for that. This la I've... I've uh, been kind of down for the count. I've been sick for the last two or three weeks, and uh, without everybody's help, this probably would not have come together. So um, I appreciate that, and I uh, just in the interest of time to kind of keep this moving, since we're running a little late, I'm not going to go through um, everybody, but uh, I, I do definitely appreciate all the help that I've gotten. Um, we do have an interest sign-up sheet that is back on the back table, and in addition, in your chair, if you happen to get a chair tonight, um, there was an information sheet that you could fill out, um, and on that sheet, it basically, uh, what we'd like you to do is if you would like some direct feedback from us, or you'd like to talk to me personally, go ahead and put your name on the sheet, and then what you would like to talk to me about, and anybody who, who uh, leaves some information for me, I will definitely contact you. Um, the next thing is, this is, uh, this doesn't feel like campaign season, but this is the time for political candidates to step forward. And so what we're really needing to do is to start, if, if you're even remotely interested in running for an office, maybe you don't even know what that office is, but you're, you feel like uh, this might be the time, you're frustrated with what's happened, right now is the time to step forward and begin doing that. And so if you um, have an interest in doing that, please on that information sheet, write your name, and then just say um, political interest and I will call you and I'll make sure that we get you engaged. Um, just a couple of things, and I kind of wanted to do this briefly because getting candidates is so important. And uh, basically, a few campaign tips for this early. Um, basically, right now, the, one of the main things you're really trying to do is do name recognition. So if anybody is interested, really what you're trying to do is to get your name out and you're going to be able to gauge interest by talking to people. So that's the main thing you're shooting for. Um, there are some campaign training classes, and I'll go through those in the announcements in just a minute. Um, one of the most important things is don't say I'm running for something yet. 
I mean, uh, you start to network, you start to meet people, um, but you can say, I'm, I'm thinking about this, uh, those types of things, and the reason is because campaign finance laws and all of those things start to kick in as soon as you're running for something. So you want to be cautious about that. Um, again, it's about name recognition. Um, the other thing that you can start doing is thinking about what issues would you run on. And um, basically what you want to do is probably become an expert in two or three, four areas. And uh, those would be things that you could then go to groups like this, or the Evergreen Tea Party, or uh, uh, Mountain Republican Women, and, and you can do presentations just saying, this is who I am, this is what I believe, and uh, you know, I've become an expert in this area. Um, and basically it's about networking and starting to gather a list of your potential supporters. And if, you, if you're remotely interested in, in running for something, please do put your information down on that sheet and I'll follow up with you. Um, at this point, all you're doing is trying to mingle with people, go to a lot of meetings, things like that. So it's not very committal. I mean, you're not locked into something. And, and so, but you need to start now if you're going to do it because waiting until the end of this year is too late. So another thing that we have going is uh, campaign training classes. And uh, those are going um, on April 12th. Uh, there's one from the Leadership Institute. This is a one-night class. The Leadership Institute is really the pre premier. Um, they, they are the premier organization for doing campaign training. And um, they're doing a, a three-hour class on April 12th. And you'll learn kind of a very high-level overview of what's going on, uh, you know, basically what's going on with uh, campaigns if you wanted to be a, either a campaign manager or a candidate. So if you're interested in getting involved organizationally in a campaign, then this is definitely something I highly recommend. Um, there's also a longer term campaign class going on, and I, I will need to give you the information on that. Um, it's uh, basically running out of Arapahoe County, but for the next six or seven months, something like that, once a month, they're having a three hour meeting. And so that's a much more involved training course. Uh, but if you're, again, if you're interested in becoming an activist, and that's what this group is about, is about activism. It's not about sitting on the couch, or it's not about complaining to our neighbors. It's about getting involved. If you're interested in actually getting involved in a campaign and you don't know anything about it, then one of these two classes, uh, preferably even both, I highly recommend. Um, here in the 285 Corridor Tea Party, uh, we've got a lot of things going on, and uh, we, we're becoming very active this year. Um, Right now, if there's anybody in the room that's a technologist, um, my background is IT, I do database work, software work, but uh, there's only one of me, and there's a lot of work to do. So if you're a technologist, if you do uh, WordPress, um, if, you do, uh, if, if you're familiar with some of the mass email programs or things like that, we're really trying to set up our infrastructure. So um, please contact me, put your information down on that sheet. Um, we also need somebody that can help with a newsletter. So if, uh, if, you're, if you've done newsletters in the past, it doesn't have to be complicated. It could just be a one-page Word document, but we haven't been able to keep up with all those things. Um, now I'm going to kind of go through some of the meetings that are going on. We've got a Jeffco Students First. Um, this is a, a good group that's meeting on the third Thursday at 1130. Um, and ideally, we'd like to have somebody from the Tea Party here go down and kind of uh, be involved in that group and bring, bring back some information about what's happening. Um, this is unfortunately kind of an inconvenient time for me, so I, I can't make these meetings. But uh, if anybody is interested in kind of being there as a representative, a liaison, if you will, uh, please contact me or put information down on this sheet. Um, our block party is another good group that's meeting. They meet down in the Littleton area. And um, uh, Jeff Wright, the author that we have in the back, is also going to be doing a presentation at our block party on this <coughs> Thursday. Um, normally they meet at Bemis, uh, Bemis Library, how do you pronounce it? Bemis. Bemis, okay. Normally they meet at Bemis Library. Um, this Thursday only they are meeting at a different location, Del Vecchio's restaurant. Um, there's also, uh, so this is down in Colorado Springs, and um, Bridget Gabriel is going to be speaking on basically the influence of radical Islam in America. 
Um, so we just wanted to provide that information to you. Um, most of this information is available on our website. If there's something that you're interested in um, that, that is not listed uh, on our website or something, you can just email us through the website. But uh, she'll be down there on April 29th. Um, American Conservatives of Color, um, they're, they're having a Truth Transcends Color Rally. And uh, that's Friday, April 5th. So um, coming up in a couple weeks here. And um, they're doing that at Tri-City Baptist Church in Westminster. Um, and I believe that is also on our calendar. Um, and then also Justin Everett. Some of you may know him. He is having a town hall meeting um, on Friday, April 12th. What you're seeing here is there are lots of opportunities to get involved. If you're interested in these things, please check out our calendar. Um, these are a couple of paid events. Um, uh, Dr. Tom Cranawetter uh, is doing ideas of uh, Ale Alexander Hamilton, just kind of exploring those. Um, and that'll be April 11th. Um, and then also, um, we've got a women's self-defense class called Armed for Her Defense. And um, that's going to be going on Saturday, April 20th. There's a fee for that. Armed for Her Defense is a uh, group that focuses on, focuses on women and Second Amendment's rights. And so, if you are either have your uh, concealed carry permit, you're interested in it, you're a woman that maybe has some questions about, about that and how it applies to you, my understanding is this is a self-defense class primarily, um, not necessarily 100%. This class is not all about guns, but the group overall is about um, encouraging Second Amendment rights and things too. And then there is also a conservative persuasion boot camp. Um, Bill Crystal from Fox News um, and uh, Stephen Hayes uh, you, you may recognize them from the news channels. We'll be down in Colorado Springs on May 3rd from 2 to 5 p.m. And there is a fee for that. Um, let's see, we've got, uh, most of this is all posted out on our calendar. If you don't know, our website is 285tparty.com. Please go out and look at our calendar. We're starting to post a, a lot of information about other groups in the area that are meeting, just because we think it's important for all of these groups to get connected and uh, to start working together. One of the problems that we've had in the past with the tea parties is they, they all kind of operate in their separate silos and there's not a lot of cross communication. And what we need to do is, we, uh, I, I, I hear this over and over again, we've got to start doing a better job of working together. Um, I, I just put this one in because I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> hypocrisy alert. I don't know if anyone had heard this, but. Uh, Bill Maher, on his show, apparently he was expressing his frustration over high taxes. And of course, if you listen to him, uh, he's always advocating those, and he only backs people that will do high taxes. But what he said was, liberals, you, uh, liberals, you can actually lose me. It's outrageous what we're paying. He was basically upset about himself paying these taxes instead of other people. And so that, that brought to my mind Margaret Thatcher's quote, the trouble with socialism is that eventually you run out of other people's money. Okay, and at this time, if anybody else has some announcements, again, we'd like to keep these kind of short, so not too involved, but yes. Hi, um, my name's Carolyn, and I'm from the white trash part of Evergreen. I see a room of fine American patriots. We are starting a group uh, up in, uh, in Evergreen um, to prepare for what's coming and to prepare for before the shit hits the fan. Um, we uh, have people, who are very high levels of skills, nurses, hunters, trackers, people experienced in food, uh, we have guys putting up greenhouses, uh, all, all, you know, health, all different kinds of interests. Our next, our, actually our first meeting is going to be on when, next Wednesday, April 3rd from 7 to 9 at the Bergen Park Firehouse. And we would sure appreciate if all of you, you would come. My email address, if you're interested, is gone, G-O-N-E dash rogue, R-O-G-U-E, it's not root, gone rogue at hotmail.com. And if some of you were interested, we're preparing. 
We're not doing political stuff. We know what's coming, and we know Homeland Security's got how many billion hollow point bullets. And today, thousands of those huge armored vehicles were were on the you know uh, tracks of railroad trains crossing the country today. So you know they're getting ready. We are getting ready, and we would sure appreciate your coming. Thank you. Great. Time. Anyone else? Tim. And, and I'm going to say this because I am a candidate, so I'm Tim Neville, Senate District 16. I was fortunate to represent all of you in Senate District 22 last year before redistricting. I uh, brought you Jeannie Nicholson for the next two years. Uh, I, I have a candidate. And I'm registered. I'll be putting envelopes to the back. You know, we, we say is, uh, money is the uh, mother's milk of politics. And, of course, early money is, is really important. I appreciate everybody's help out here. But uh, bottom line... We deserve better, and it's my goal to make sure that I work my tail off for you. So you back. are running, you are planning to run against her? Yes, sir. Okay, I'm let's talk. Well, I'll give you a lot of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we need to hear. All right. Um, for those of you who haven't, uh, who may not know, Tim has uh, been here before, and he is a uh, great guy. He's uh, been very supportive of our group, and uh, he's a wealth of information. Um, anyway, I, I do urge you to contact and follow up with him and look on his website. Any other announcements? Yes? Um, hi, I'm Sharon Trilk. I don't know if anybody knows, tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of the Lower North Fort fire starting, and there is a press conference and rally for the victims down at the Capitol in Denver at noon, and Sherry Duro is hosting, so if you can make it and show support for our neighbors, that would be great. Thanks. Where was that again? It's at the Capitol. At the Capitol, mm -hmm. okay. At noon. Any other announcements? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to insert one here. Um, we may be considering a new location, <laughs> given the seating arrangement. Um, and I know that uh, we, we've actually talked about this before, but this may kind of press the issue. Um, we've, we've been talking about uh, either the um, Elk Creek Fire Protection District um, office or uh, possibly the uh, Indian Hills. I, I, and I'm not for, very familiar with their facilities down there. Um, just kind of a show of hands. Uh, well, first, does anyone know if the uh, the uh, place down the hill with uh, Inner Canyon, do, do they have a good meeting room in that area? It's limited. Yes. They do. So Stay here in Conifer. Stay here in Conifer? Yeah. Stay here in Conifer. Okay. So, so neither of, so the vote is against both of those? Is that what you're saying? Elk Creek. Elk Creek would be good. Elk Creek. Okay. Okay. Very good. So... What is, is there anywhere else that anyone would suggest? I can open up my shop. Okay. You'll see probably, I would say 75 to 100. Oh, okay. So if you want to meet with me, I can show it. Okay. Can take yeah, we'll take seat. a look at both those locations. Yes. Do we have uh, to? You could use the barn. Okay. We can have 250 there. Wow. Okay. And where, where uh, exactly where is Everything that? Memorial Park. Okay. Barn. Great. Fantastic. Well, we've got three good options. Anyone else? This may not continue to work for us, so <laughs> very good. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to do was a quick poll on where some interest might lie for some of the uh, future uh, talks. Um, we, we've actually we focused a lot on Second Amendment rights here for the last several months. Um, if you're on our email list already, um, you've been receiving those those emails about what's going on with the legislature. If you're not on our list, please make sure you do get signed up before you leave. But um, we've been focusing on that quite a bit. I don't know uh, really where the interest lies. Um, just out of curiosity, how many of you are here primarily because you're motivated about Second Amendment and you knew the sheriffs were going to be here talking about it? Okay. And also, um, is there an interest in continuing having a small segment of each meeting for a while as long as this is kind of going on Second Amendment? or uh, And then... I don't want to burn people out on the same thing, but how many would be interested in having at least one speaker each meeting for the next several meetings? Raise of hands on Second Amendment. Okay, about 50% anyway. Um, these are some of the other things that we've been toying with for topics, and um, on your piece of paper, if you would, um, w please write down either some of the things that you have in mind or maybe one of these options, but. Um, 
One of the topics potentially would be the GOP and the liberty movements, the Tea Parties, and how they kind of interface. Um, bring some people in to, to talk about how we could work with the GOP and um, kind of uh, maintain an influence in what's going on on the GOP side. Um, also, uh, we, I've had quite a few people that have talked to me about kind of the politics of division. I don't know if that's the right term or not. But basically, what the left is exceptionally good at is dividing the population and then, and then getting each segment motivated. And I think that on the right, we tend to think more in terms of um, general principles and not divide and turn people against each other. They um, lie, we don't. <laughs> that's true, too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, anyway, the, I guess the, one of the things is that we've seen that they've been very effective at this. And you see it with a lot of the minority groups where they've uh, effectively split them off, given them the things that they want, motivated them individually, while over here telling people maybe the opposite things, the lies, um, that motivates this group. And, and they've been able to kind of divide these groups up and kind of turn them, uh, 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 get, get them focused in, on um, their own special interests. So um, the question then, I think, for us in the liberty movements is that uh, is how do we address that? Do we address it by division ourselves? I don't believe so. I think there is a consistent message that can appeal to all of these groups. Um, we also have had some requests for messaging. Um, how do you, some of the controversial issues, how do we address them from a messaging perspective? Um, Second Amendment, of course. And then the other thing is um, ex legislators. Uh, people that are right now legislators bringing in speakers along those lines. Um, if you don't know him, Justin Everett is another great guy. Um, and uh, the, we, we do have several great legislators around that could come in and talk to us about what's going on in the Capitol um, and what, what we can be doing. So if you would, please do write that down and make sure you either leave your piece of paper on your seat or leave it at the back table when you walk out. So. This group right now, this is our monthly meeting, and uh, the purpose of this group is, is to provide educational opportunities, provide an opportunity for a big group to come together like this, talk about different issues, and find out what's going on, current events. Um, but really what we're about is this 285 activists group. And um, the 285 activists are a group of people who are basically roll up your sleeves and let's get the work done. And again, the, you know, uh, education only will take us so far. And then beyond that, we, we've, got to, we've got to just get in and get it done. And so the 285 Activist Group, actually, so this is the fourth Monday. The 285 Activist Group meets on the first Monday of the month. So it, it'll be next week, a week from now. Um, we have a meeting, and basically that's where we're going to come together. We, we are actually drawing up um, plans for exactly what we're going to do. And, and we're focused on getting those plans accomplished. Uh, everybody that comes to the 285 activist group is asked to do at least one hour of work outside of all of the meetings every month. So there's an expectation that there will be work that's done outside of these meetings. You can't just show up at the meetings. Um, so again, we have the general membership group, fourth Monday, and then the activist group on the first Monday. If you're interested in becoming an activist, please put that on your information sheet also. Um, so... Uh, Basically, we're doing this a, a, a couple of things with this. Again, roll up your sleeves. Let's get things done. We, we're focusing on what we're calling SMART goals. And um, uh, basically, a commitment of one hour per week. And it, ultimately, all of this is about winning elections. If we don't win elections, then none, nothing that we're doing matters. You being here in this room does not matter if we don't win elections. So SMART goals. Basically, they're very specific goals. Um, measurable. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be setting dates and expectations in a very objective way, and we will either meet those ex expectations or we won't. Um, but there are, there are a lot of groups that get together and say, you know, we need to change the we need to change the course of political events, or we need to change the way people think about things. And we're taking really a much more measured approach to this, and uh, everything that we're working on, we'll be able to put metrics to. Um, in our first meeting last, uh, last month, we had 13 people, so I was very happy with that turnout for the first meeting. Um, and uh, basically, we pri prioritized two different projects that we're going to be working on and drawing up SMART goals for. Um, the first one is the Jefferson County GOP project, and really what that's doing is, is uh, 
trying to get not only this group, but other liberty groups, Tea Parties, uh, 912s, uh, getting them connected and trying to uh, see how we can work within the GOP to accomplish our goals. And so this is really a group about um, these groups all meeting and coordinating and trying to be effective. Um, the other is the voter integrity projects. I don't know if you heard this, but there were actually four counties in the state of Colorado that had more voters than, than they have population. Um, it seems unlikely, but apparently that's the way it works. So um, we, we, uh, we've, had, um, we've been involved in a couple of efforts, and um, I literally believe there are tens of thousands of people who are illegally registered in the state of Colorado. And, and basically what this voter integrity project is about is about working to identify where those illegal registrations are and trying to do something about them. Denver. We, we actually had a, uh, many of them are from Denver, but the counties that actually had more voters than population were not Den Denver. I can't remember which ones they were off the top of my head. Does anyone know? But anyway, they, but, uh, but um, Denver actually, in Denver, there was an effort that got started at the very tail end of the last election. Actually, it all came together within 20, with a 24-hour window, and um, 2,000 voters were identified. One of them was 211 years old, which seems suspicious. Uh, there were five 17-year-olds, and um, there were also, um, uh, of the 2,000, a lot of those were people who were the same person registered in multiple precincts. Now, some of that can be legitimate. They could be somebody that registered here, they moved three blocks away, and they didn't, you know, cancel out their registration back here. So it could be legitimate, but it also could be, it's also potentially a source of fraud. So that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of in that group. Um, and then uh, the other thing that we did this last month, and again, thank you very much. First, I'd like everybody that was at the activist uh, meeting this last time, could you stand up? I'd like to just recognize you real quick. Everybody that was at the activist meeting. That's you too. <laughs> okay. Very good. Um, this, this is where the rubber meets the road, and this is about getting the work done. Um, everybody came together on this and helped out with the organization and planning for this meeting. And uh, again, like I said, I mean, without that help, this may not have come together. So um, they helped with this, and now we're getting ready to kind of shift our focus to the other two projects. So um, the other thing that we're going to do is uh, we are going to ask uh, for donations to help support our program. Um, last month we had a, a, a smaller crowd, but uh, we, we are just barely pulling in enough to kind of get by. And, wh and what we uh, would really like to do is, is uh, to bring in some money so that these activist um, projects that I just mentioned here, the uh, Jefferson County GOP and the Voter Integrity Project, we have the funding that it takes to make those happen. And so, I think, who's going to start that? Does somebody have a basket? What's that? Oh, this is the basket? Okay. I'm just going to start passing this around, and if you could. Um, there is also a donation basket back near the refreshments. But one of the things I want to emphasize is, this is not a, we're, we're not collecting donations for the cookies in the back. That's not what this is about. This is about having the money that it's going to take to make this happen. Um, this room here, we pay for this every time, and so uh, last at, at the last meeting, we collected enough to pay for the room, and I think we had four or five dollars left over after that. So um, if you can dig deep, we appreciate it. So the other thing that I would like to encourage you to do is, um, because this is a group about action, what can you do right now? Think about what you can do right now to take action. And the one thing that I've asked at the last several meetings, and it appears to have been effective, is I've asked everybody to think of two people they could invite to the next meeting. So I'm going to give you just a second. Think about the two people you could invite to the next meeting. Um, and then over the next month, your part as a, as a Tea Party activist is just to contact them and say, hey, I went to this great group, and, and this is what happened, and we encourage you to come too. Um, and then also, we've got, uh, again, on the list, please put your name down if, uh, if you have an interest in the 285 Activist Group, and uh, hopefully we can get that going. All right, um, at this point, if I could, I'd like to invite um, Dave, can you come on up? 
And um, this is Dave Murray. Uh, Dave is one of the uh, board members on the 285 Tea Party. And um, he's going to introduce uh, Sheriff Ted Mink and Fred Wagner. Hi. Number one, thanks for coming out. This is way beyond our expectations for tonight. So thanks for uh, everybody taking time to come out. Um, fortunately, uh, I'd like to think maybe you came here because we were going to be speaking, but I have a feeling it was probably more for Sheriff Mink and Sheriff Wagner. Uh, you probably know their backgrounds, but um, Sheriff Mink has um, been in law enforcement. Oh, excuse me, I didn't mean to step in the foot there. Uh, Sheriff Mink's been in law enforcement for about 40 years now, starting out in Boulder and then 30 years with Arvada, and now the uh, sheriff in, um, in Jeffco since 1973. So he's been um, elected and re-elected three times, so um, obviously he must be doing something right. And in the case of uh, Sheriff Wagner, uh, he's been a um, law enforcement officer, officer since 1987, four terms as sheriff in, in uh, Park <coughs> County, and uh, resident of Park County since 1970, and a Colorado native. So I think, oh yeah, here's Sheriff Meek right here, and Sheriff Wagner. Yeah, sheriff so. So we're going to turn the floor over to him and uh, make this presentation. Who do you want to start? Yeah. Do well yeah. medical. Yeah. Well, <laughs> always, Fred, uh, Fred and I have, believe it or not, we talked today about what we're going to do and we don't have a clue. <laughs> but that being said, uh, I'm sure what's pressing on everybody's mind is certainly the recent legislation having to do with uh, guns and firearms. And um, I think Fred and I are in consensus that we're in awe that number one, it got passed, and number two, uh, the mandates and the requirements of those pieces of legislation that in my opinion, I'm sure Fred will agree, we have no hope of ever enforcing because they're so convoluted, so general, uh, and there's a lot of issues involved with that. And that being said, obviously they become law on July 1st. Now, legislators can make the laws, as you all know, as Senator Neville knows, can make the laws. But we, as law enforcement administrators, set the priorities for our organizations. And I guarantee you, for both our organizations and probably 62 of the sheriffs in the state of Colorado, that priority is way down here. <laughs> so I don't want to give you the false impression we, impression we might not use it, but if we're investigating a horrific crime, a shooting or something like that, we may take one of those statues up and tack it onto somebody that has committed a horrific crime. That's the only place I see those legislations, especially the, uh, the uh, magazine capacity, ever being used in our organization. So I don't want to put words in Fred's mouth, but I just did. <laughs> I was kind of looking forward to the background check because I thought, I thought that meant that everybody's going to invite me to their house every time they have a uh, transferring of firearms. Uh, no, uh, Sheriff Biggs, uh, dead on. I, you know, we we looked at this. Uh, you know, we uh, went down and uh, testified. Uh, we met with uh, uh, different uh, senators and and uh, representatives, and uh, we. Uh, apparently uh, are insignificant uh, as uh, all of you. So don't you like that? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I couldn't figure out when our lovely governor said that the majority of Coloradans wanted this. Now I see there's a lot of folks right here. So the majority of you, right, can I see a lot of uh, hands go up on how many wanted it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah there you go. So, um, so um, are the sheriffs a little um, upset? Um, yeah. Um, as I hope each and every one of you are. Um, I heard somebody talk about voting. Hmm. That's a novel idea. Because I think that the only way we're ever going to change this again is to make sure that uh, folks depart the legislature and we get folks in there that will stand up and do something. I, I, a lot of um, I, you know, I saw one senator on one of the uh, uh, committees and uh, I was... Uh, 
kind of shocked. Um, I don't think his mother knew he was playing senator that day, but um, <laughs> he, uh, he just did not know. He thought that all of this was a joke. You know, when you've got a company like Magpul that says they're pulling out of Colorado, they're taking 200 jobs, and that's just the jobs at their factory, and they're leaving Colorado because nobody wants you. Know, that's not the kind of jobs we want, according to the governor. Really? So we're so high and mighty that we can afford to dictate what kind of jobs we want in Colorado? We have so much revenue coming in? Hmm. I wonder where that's at. So, uh, I I'm hoping, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping all of you are, are going uh, to be able to uh, help out. Um, you know, and I, I hear all this about, um, and I, I, I think you're right on when you say that you want to do it, uh, you want to take uh, those steps, you're not going to be, you know, we don't want to be uh, jerks about it, but I think we want to do is go contact those individuals who we think that can make an honest effort to get in there and stand up for what the Constitution was written and what it's all about. Right. And uh, I don't think we're seeing that. You know, Fred and I talked uh, back in January when the sheriffs met at the conference and decided to come up with a, a supporting document for our position. And uh, the, for whatever reason, the legislators missed the point. It's not about guns. It's about the mentally ill people using guns to commit yeah, yeah. horrific crimes. So why not focus on allowing us, law enforcement, to look at the records of those that have been diagnosed with a mental illness and see if they pose a threat to the community and then have the tools to do what I think we need to do and that's keep, keep those guns out of those uh, individuals that have some diagnosed mental illness that could potentially be a harm to themselves and others. That's all we ask in our position paper. We focus more on that than we did anything else. Mm -hmm. But that went, I don't know where it went. It went in Never, Never Neverland as far as an argument or support for our position. I will tell you, I think our backs were against the wall from the get-go because the, I don't want to speak disparaging about chiefs of police, but at, their organization supported all these bills. So, the legislators obviously put more stock into their uh, support of the legislation than, than the sheriffs, which, uh, again, I don't get since we are elected representing <coughs> constituents. But uh, I'm with Fred. I'm, um, if you want change, it's got to start at the polls. It really does. Because we, we, we gave it our best shot, and, and it was like uh, shouting at the rain with some of them. Uh, they need to they need to be woken up. Now that we've created controversy. There you go. That's it. <laughs> Sir. Um, I'm a retired 30 year law enforcement officer myself. Um, it's my understanding I, I'm not expecting a legal uh, assessment from you, but maybe you can tell everybody here whether you know or understand what's going on on registration. Federal law prohibits registration of individual firearms owners. This new law that they just passed on the background check includes registration. That's not my understanding. I, I did not see that part written in it. I think there was a there's a conclusion, I think, that's written in it. It's the only way you're going to be able to force it is you're going to have to have some sort of registration. I think that's what's implied in there. Uh, but it doesn't specifically say that. No. But I, I believe that's the foundation for the next step. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. So we, that's my that's my impression of it. So again, impression. you're both it. against any of that, um, probably because of what happened in New York, where all the registered firearms re were released in the newspaper. Yeah. The uh, and Fred may differ uh, in his <coughs> thoughts on this, but. We do background checks all the time for those applying for concealed weapons sure. permits. Why isn't that good enough? Exactly. The CBI says it isn't. Well, I know the CBI director, and that's not necessarily true. Um, well, they don't have the capacity, really, they don't have the capacity to do what this legislation says without funding from the Joint Budget Committee, and they have not approved anywhere close to that. So. 
<coughs> they're capable of doing it system wide. Well, to the extent that the law, I don't mean to interrupt. No, I don't know. No, I'm interrupting. I I totally agree with you, but and it baffles me not only as a citizen but as a law enforcement officer who had to enforce these kind of garbage laws. How this stuff ever got through committee, let alone getting passed into the governor's desk. This committees were stacked. Well, they're in control, and they're going to make sure everybody knows it. That's what happened. Um, one one other question. In in your area, I go shooting up at uh, Harris Park from time to time. Um, and I know that you said the priority levels down here, but if I'm out there with my AK or AR, whatever I might have that has a bigger capacity than 15 rounds, uh, even though I owned them long before this bill, uh, if one of your guys gets called, is there going to be a problem? Good question. No. How do you prove it? Yeah. That's, part of the, that's part of the problem with the bill. Well, I understand that. Um, but I don't think it says that it's grandfathered either. I think dog running at large takes priority. <laughs> <laughs> Legislation, Fred Hard Gun, right here. That's against the law because that magazine can't be altered. Yeah, yeah. Right. How, How do you handle it? it? Yeah. I mean, what does the law yeah, there you go. There you go. No, that's, 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 we don't. We don't know. I'm, I'm still waiting for the, uh, it's because it's supposed to go to John Southern, so it's supposed to come up with the uh, drafting of how we're supposed to enforce this, and then that's, I'm anxious to see, because I don't know. We're like this, we don't know. Because all your SWAT teams, assault teams, sir, are they going to be limited to pins? No, there's a law yeah. enforcement exemption. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the back. Uh, what about on domestic violence calls? How is that going to be handled? See, that, to me, that's, that's where I thought if there was any um, common sense was ever uh, brought into the equation, that these weren't going to be sentence enhancements. So if somebody committed a violent act and they have to have a high capacity, well, yeah, then I could say, okay, well, let's, let's do a sentence enhancement. Like domestic violence, you know, it's a sentence enhancement. Um, yeah, what's going to happen uh, probably when we arrive there? Um, again, how are you going to prove that? I mean, if they had the magazines, and I know the standard answer is I bought it before July 1st, um, I have no way to, to say they didn't. Okay, it, it was also, I've worked with the Equal Justice Foundation down in uh, Colorado Springs for mm -hmm. a number of years, and I'm and working with law enforcement on, on uh, DV calls. And, you know, there's, there, there's a real problem with assessing the situation to determine, I'm sure you're aware of this, with, to determine um, um, if the issue of firearms in the home is going to come up, and there's a particular problem with child protective services getting very overzealous when there's absolutely like no yeah. reason on that particular call that would do that to push the issue. And under these laws, that would open a whole floodgate of issues when you're talking about uh, uh, going into a situation where uh, starting into trying to implement parts of these laws is not really warranted but, you know, but you're going to have child protective services pushing on it. You're going to have uh, all kinds of other situations. So it's, it's going to be a really sticky issue of where this would have never come up before. Now it's going to come up a lot. And we're just wondering how you thought about it, how that's going to hand, be handled. Well, some of these issues I obviously are going to have to come from John Southers, but certainly your particular thing. We always consult with the district attorney's office at least in the first judicial district. And uh, I've talked to Pete Weir, our district attorney, about some of these things. And uh, obviously, <coughs> we arrest somebody that's on probable cause. When they have to take something to trial, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. All these legislations right now don't even rise to any reasonable doubt. So he's saying, how can you prosecute somebody with a 30-round mag who says, I had it before July 1st, you're going to process, I mean, who's to say there, 
what the situation is, but that applies to DVs as well. Well, there's, there's already situations going on, like in New York, and you know, other places where they fired past in these restricted gun laws, and uh, a call is initiated, and a uh, uh, child protection service, they'll show up the house, they'll demand to search the house for weapons immediately. Regardless of whether they need an assess the situation. Still need a warrant. Yeah. yeah, don't get that confused with the fact that when the temporary uh, when the temporary protection order is in place, that the suspect has to relinquish control of all his weapons. No, I understand that, but this is before the, this is before the, the protective order has been issued. When there's the first yeah, that, call. of course, and that was a horrible. Uh, what was that? That was New Jersey, though, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, was, that was that was horrible. There's one yeah. visible one in New Jersey. There's been other ones that haven't hit the, above much above the radar yet that have been going on in New York already since they passed their law, where they're just using the domestic violence call as a pretext to start going into the home to uh, search for weapons. Well, that's why New York is jacked up. I'm <laughs> 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 just wondering where you think the burden of proof would be on the magazines, for yeah. instance, should people that are purchasing them now save their receipts as an affirmative defense that they actually got them prior to July 1st? I can tell you from Pete Weir's but opinion, the burden of proof is on us. Yeah. Good. Proof that bought That's his, that's what... His statement has been to, to law enforcement. There has been some kind of chatter going around that it would be a good idea to inventory your magazines, get some photos, put them together, and have it motorized just so you have something, some documentation. I don't know if that's something you guys recommend. I mean, the reality is, is most of us firearms owners are not going to interact with you that way anyway. So. But it seems like it wouldn't be such a bad idea. Yeah, might not bad for your records in case yeah. something gets stolen. <laughs> Ron. I had a question. Um, article in Denver Post uh, by uh, Terry Mankata, uh, El Paso County Sheriff. Makita. 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 And he says, yeah, we have a database for concealed carry permits. Who is that database shared with? Right now it's uh, in my... It's, Office next to mine. Yeah. We just for our skilled weapons permits for Jefferson County. Can Homeland Security access that database? No. No, no not, not this lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> How about State Patrol? No. <coughs> it's our personal records. And the press has tried to get a hold of them, believe me. Can they use Freedom of Information Act? They for can, but they're still, I am the keeper of the records, yeah. I decide what they're doing. Can they be sequestered? I suppose anything can be sequestered, <laughs> but we have attorneys that will argue that those are my records. And they might, you know, we could have a fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it happened. <laughs> yes, ma'am. God bless you. Can we vote out And that's what we're, that's kind of what I, uh, Sheriff Nick and I have been talking about. We kind of think that's what's going to probably happen is, is I think as soon as these are signed, I think what you're going to see is that you're going to see some, uh, some uh, uh, affidavits filed and this thing's probably going to be headed to the Colorado State Supreme Court. Well, question. So, we can't find anybody who wants to enforce these darn things. And the problem is, in order to challenge the law, you have to have standing. And so somebody's going to have to get arrested for having a 15-round magazine. So here's my question. Sheriff Mink, when I call you to come and arrest me, <laughs> come to the ranch and I'll buy, well, I'll buy the deputy a beer, I promise. <laughs> I can do that, but you have to submit to a strip search. <laughs> oh! <laughs> State patrol. We don't have a state police state in Colorado. Patrol, thank you. Um, I have no idea. They don't have a chief right now. Have they, have they published a position on these? Yeah, remember the, 
that's actually that's why we have a state patrol, not a state police. Right. Uh, we had remember in the 1920s. Uh, some of you probably remember that. Uh, <laughs> We had the Ledlow Massacre, and because of the Ledlow Massacre, we'll never have a state police organization in Colorado. So, yeah, I mean, they'll do whatever the, uh, um, you know, the state, uh, chief state patrol tells them to. Yeah, they work for the state. Yeah. If I might add to that, if any of you were at the Conifer uh, Town Hall, Terry Manwaring got up uh, and made a uh, statement that was pretty consistent with Sheriff Wagner and Sheriff uh, Mink. And who is he? Well, I don't, is he still active? He yeah, fun? he's captain with the sheriff's office. He's a longtime resident up here. I, I'm surprised you could see him if he stood up. <laughs> <laughs> he went up there, yeah. I thought he was state patrol. No, no. Oh, okay, never mind that. Okay. Yes, ma'am, in the one all the way back. What is the future looking in your eyes um, for CCW? As far as what? Um, because various places, a lot of rumors flying that they're going to try to take that away. On the, on the state and on the federal level. I've heard that one. Yeah, I, I, Dr. I, I will tell you that as a result, well, <coughs> when uh, President Obama had talked about gun control, we, my office was inundated with requests for CCW permits. So far we have 20,000 of them out there in Jefferson. Number one gun salesman of the year. <laughs> yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> Four years are on it. Well, I have a question regarding legislation on transfer. So I'm a NRA certified firearms instructor, and part of my business is we provide either rental firearms or you know loaners for students that come out. So there's in the industry there's a lot of confusion around this. If I if I rent a firearm to a student, is that then a transfer? And do we need to go through the background check? The way the legislation's written, it's so nebulous, it, it's confusing. So you know, for those of us in the in the training industry. We're, we're looking at as a potential threat that we could lose, you know, possibly revenue or, or lose student base. Who, who, you know, you got 20,000 people that are CCW certified in the state. That doesn't mean there's 20,000 trained, skilled individuals. They, so, you know, kind of what's your thoughts on that? Because that that legislation is just a mess. <laughs> we're, we're like you. Yeah. Until we get some direction from the attorney general or a district attorney. I, I honestly can't answer that because it's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. Well, it's my understanding you have 72 hours. I can loan you a gun for 72 hours before it becomes a transfer under the new law. Mm -hmm. Still, there's no mechanism for the $10 fee when yeah. you sell right, it to yeah. I mean, the whole thing is New Yorkish. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I'm coming up on the 10th year of my CCW. Now, do I have to be recertified? So you got it. Uh, you got ten, ten years ago, when it first passed. Yeah. Oh, you got it. Okay. Um, five years. I think you got five years. Yeah, five years. <coughs> it's it's That's what I was going to say. Yeah, you might. might I think it's, yeah, the certificate's only good for uh, ten. But I think you're. Are you sure it didn't expire five years? No, I mean I'm. I renewed it five years oh, ago, gotcha, the actual okay, permit. Yeah. Oh, gotcha, but do okay. I have to go to another class now since ten years has elapsed? Well, yeah. the shooting part of it. Yeah. The um, shooting? Well, yeah, I think you do. I think that, that's correct. The current, the current law, you do. And it's got to be the shooting part, not the. Because see, now they're just doing classroom. Mm -hmm. and that's all, it wasn't four hours classroom. Yeah. So just classroom? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. What, do, what does the law actually state about the uh, AR-15s and that, and the uh, the bullets that you can carry? Well, right now it doesn't matter. But, but right, but I mean the new law. Yeah, the new laws say that you can't have a uh, magazine over 15 rounds. Okay. Which is um, funny because uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think they make one for an AR that's under. No, uh, no they don't. Have you made a ten round? Yeah. But they'll probably start if enough states. Yeah, but go that it's way. convertible. Right. Right. Yes, there you go. Well, the, big, the next big issue I think you'll hear coming out of the governor's <coughs> office yeah. is the assault rifle ban. Yeah. 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 This is right. the first. Yeah. That, that's the one you need to really pay attention to. I think they'll go after that next. Say that again, Sheriff. I, we can't say I that. think they'll go after the assault rifle ban next. Got it. L let me make a point here. We, everybody says assault 
weapons. They are not assault weapons. They're semi-automatic rifles. We all use that type of language. Don't fall into the trap of using their language. I mean, everywhere you hear this, it's an assault weapon. So people flip out. Well, I don't have a class three, so I only have semi-automatics. Good point, I stand corrected. Semi-automatic. Yeah. <laughs> All the way in the back. Um, if, without going too far into the weeds, I have a question. You just mentioned the distinction between <coughs> state patrol and state police. I don't, I don't have a legal background, but I am kind of interested in what you meant by that. W what is that? In other words, uh, in uh, places that have state police, um, are usually, if you look, they don't have, their sheriff's offices are like... Uh, I'll use Michigan or something like they like they only take care of like court and the, and running the jail. They don't do any uh, proactive law enforcement. Um, in Colorado, the uh, sheriffs of each one of the counties, um, we take care of law enforcement and we take care of everything for our counties. State patrol, only thing they do is investigate accidents and uh, do uh, traffic enforcement on the highways and byways. And then uh, and then motor carrier and executive protection. Yeah. Yes, sir. Also, to address the uh, young woman's question about the direction of the uh, concealed carry, it's in federal circuit court appeals has uh -huh. delinked CC with the Second Amendment. The slope is very clear. We are on a path to registration, which will lead to further negative effects for those of us who choose to live in this kind, formerly kind nation. Uh, I'd like to hear from Sheriff Mangle. Thank you very much for your years and years of service to this county. Uh, if, uh, supposing a district attorney such as Scott Story were to issue a directive that all law enforcement in, in his jurisdiction must enforce provisions of these laws. What then, therefore, sir, would your response be? Number one, number one, he legally can't do it. Number two, we have statutory responsibilities. As long as I follow the statutory responsibilities, uh, I'm doing what the voters voted me in for. I don't have to do what a district attorney says uh, because I have just as much legal authority as he does. He prosecutes. That's his sole responsibility. Ours is enforcement. Ours is bringing those people before him to be prosecuted. Again, we set the priorities. And if Scott Story were to say that, I would, I would laugh. <laughs> Thank you for that amplification and clarification. Yeah. 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 And Scott would never do that, by the way. Because he's no longer DA. Yeah. I, just one other thing. I wanted to get some clarification. It's your understanding <clears throat> that the magazine ban um, does not have written in it that you have to prove as the owner of that magazine an affirmative defense, in other words? Not yet. Not in the legislation. Because no. yeah. so, yeah. I had heard that it was. I can't even find the bills on the internet. So. It's on us. It's on us. Well, and I, as a law enforcement officer, that's the way it should be. But um, I you know, these tricky devils in the state house, you know, who knows what they're trying to do. You know, I, I want, to, want to say one thing. You know, when we were down there, um, our, our representative, or our uh, uh, senators that were, uh, that were Republicans, uh, kept on uh, asking us each time, um, was law enforcement ever consulted in the drafting of these bills? No. Never. They were never consulted. It just weren't going to have all these problems. Yeah, if you want to protect yourself on these magazines, take a newspaper with the date and everything on it, lay them out there, take a picture, and there's no question in it. If you got 25 magazines in front of that newspaper, they can stop it. <laughs> or they can use the newspaper when they have that. <laughs> Anybody else? Sir? He's a legislator. Just take a newspaper, set it right there, take it over.
Which means they are unenforceable. Yes, correct. Now, you're, I'm sure you're familiar with Sheriff Cook in Will County. John? Yeah, yeah, yeah. On the news. I love that guy. Yeah. yeah. I don't love him, but he's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you an interesting story about Sheriff Cook. He went to Arvada West High School when I was a patrol officer in Arvada. I think I arrested him. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was a Jew probably. <laughs> All the way back. Yes, no, you, yes. Since we know that the Socialist Democrats are really trying to take away our uh, Second Amendment rights due to the fact that it's really not to take the weapons out of the hands of criminals, it's really to disarm the people. And then with DHS buying at billions of rounds of hollow point, in your opinion, what do you think our government's really up to? Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll defer to you. We have a one-hour time limit. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I honestly don't know. I mean, you can read between the lines, but uh, it's scary to me. I don't know what. I don't know what the. And I'll be frank, because I'm term limited. I don't know what the Obama administration's up to. I really don't. Uh, no good. He's probably going to get another Nobel Peace Prize. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so I honestly, I don't, I honestly can't answer that because I don't know, but it's, it's, it's not good. Aren't we on the same track as the Nazis? Well, that, that's been argued. Yeah. That's been argued. Yeah. That's been argued. Yeah. If you really want to be safe, move to Texas. <laughs> I have a final question. I really appreciate you guys coming out. I mean, this, this late at night, you got other things to do. It is. I've been up since 4 o'clock this morning. <laughs> so I have a clarification question. So, you know, I've put through 500 students through different types of training classes. And one of the questions that always comes up, that even for instructors is hard to clarify, is when you interact with law enforcement, right? You're, you're driving to work, you get you get pulled for speeding, you know, down the chutes on 285. Um, We've been teaching our students that you don't you don't bring the situation of a weapon in the vehicle or a concealed carry permit up unless asked by the officer. It, you know, I have two of my local sheriffs right here. What would you like us as instructors to be teaching people about interacting with law enforcement while you're carrying concealed? That don't get cold. Just let them know? Yeah, let them know. Okay. If they ask, let them know. If they ask, let them know proactively. Well, hey, by the way, guys, here's my hands. <laughs> I'm a good wait, guy. I'll wait to see if they ask yeah. because you're obviously they're stopping you for something yeah. like speeding, especially if you're going through Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> He writes tickets. <laughs> I am very accustomed to having people present their, their uh, CCW to me on a traffic stop. It took a little getting used to. I'd say thank you. You, you can put it back in your wallet. Uh, if I ask, if I have a concern and I ask, all right, then I, I want an answer. But do you need to offer it to me? As far as I'm concerned, no. But if you do, I'm going to say thanks. But it comes up on your system, right? You know automatically. Does it? But is it not true also? It doesn't. Okay, no, no, no. They, they, no, no. CBI had to dump that database. They, see, they used to have, it used to be that we used to send the fingerprints in, and that CBI maintained a database of all the CCW holders. They had, that was dumped. They no longer have that. That would be a big part That was beautiful. All right, I gotta switch to this side because okay. I, yeah, I messed up. Hold on one second. Yep, yes, uh, I heard if we got eighty-five thousand signatures that this could be put back on a ballot um, for repealing some of these things. I don't know. I, I did not hear that. Senator, you know, she said um, she said she heard that they got eighty-five thousand signatures that this could get repealed. Go ahead. Uh, there's, a, there's, there's a group right now that's, that's, that's working up the ballot initiative language. Uh, we need 86,000 signatures for an initiated uh, amendment. 
uh, and, and for, or an initiated referendum. However, each of the bills has an emergency and safety clause on the bottom, so it can't be by initiated referendum. It has to be by initiated amendment. That language is being worked on uh, is being worked on right now, um, and I, there will probably, most likely, based on the initiative review process and the title setting process, there will be a ballot initiative petition out on the street sometime in the fall. Collect uh, and you'll need and you need to collect a, a hundred and about 125,000 signatures to qualify 86,000 valid um, or to be put on the 2014 ballot. Yeah, I was going to talk to that the issue a little later, but everybody uh, did. Yeah. So, so that's what it's for us to be put on the ballot in 2014. To be put on the ballot for 2014, and that's going to be a project for this group. I'm, I've been telling you know, groups all around the state, yeah. or I've been touring that that's what these groups are going as an action item coming out in the future. Uh, everybody in this room like 100 signatures that go on in the snap. I would call that a priority item. Right. So uh, yeah, but it is it is a work in progress and. Uh, and should be out sometime through the summer. We'll start hearing more about Jeff, it. Jeff, is there a, a group that we can connect with on that or a not, website? Not now. They have not announced now. this is all this is all under the radar right now. So yeah. they, they have the, the, the committee that's working with all the key people around the state and uh, are working on the language and then we have to review the language. This is yeah. it's gotta be short and sweet and, and directed to the point. As a, a, a as a constitutional amendment, that they can take all six, all for all four bills out at the same time. No, that's good. Thank you, Thank you. Mike. Yeah, I, uh, I've had a CCW for quite a long time, and um, uh, that question is always asked. And uh, when I have students, and I've worked with the Park County Sheriff's Department for 20 years in firearms instruction, and um, I uh, I say, number one. We're all law-abiding citizens, so we'll never have a traffic stop, right? Okay. And, uh, and the next thing is, if you do pass the attitude test, that's a good thing. It's not it's not specified in law. It's just a smart thing to do. Yes, sir. No, sir. Not if you, you know, all that stuff that goes on. So those are good good trick words right there. Now, if you've got a Colorado CCW, it's not valid in all states. Maybe. Colorado has what they call reciprocity with about 14 states. So you better check if you go to New Mexico, your Colorado no good there. Uh, it's no good in Washington State and a number of other states around. It's certain nobody says any good in California. But there's no good in California anyway. There aren't any. That's all here. Unless you're politically connected. Yeah. Um, so I got a Utah CCW, which is good in most other states because they have reciprocity. But on the application, it specifies if you are stopped in traffic stop in Utah, you must discuss with the officer that you have a permit for concealed carry in Utah. So, travel when you travel, if you're invisible and you travel as a law-abiding citizen and never have any reason for anybody to stop, you shouldn't have any problem. But you should know what your state laws imply. Now, just because of that doesn't mean I'm not going to carry concealed when I'm in California. I'm just going to try to be really good. Yeah, no, part of that's because <laughs> Utah doesn't have Colorado. The Colorado State Supreme Court already ruled that your vehicle's an extension of your home. So, and I don't think Utah they didn't do that. Yeah. Uh, so. And I got to say, working with the Park County Sheriff Department, and of course uh, Sheriff Mink um, is another stalwart county sheriff. We're really pleased to have this. It's guys like them who are going to keep this the state of Colorado and not the state of California. So let's support these gentlemen. Yeah. The automobile is an extension of the purse, an extension of the man. Then would my airplane be an extension of the woman? <laughs> While I'm flying over other states? We, apparently we need to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, because, uh, and there's an 80 pilots, but I believe there's an FHA rule that they have to discuss there, then, isn't it, for uh, weapons? FAA? FAA, I'm sorry. We've checked the FAA. There is nothing there. No. No? But if, oh, okay. Only if commercial. Well, but think about Only for If the car is an extension, and I'm traveling across yes, another uh, state by car, it's, yeah, it's if I'm that. flying, I'm in air, which is legal airspace. If I must land to get fuel, but I am not 
taking the weapon outside of the airplane, do I have a problem? That's a federal law that specifically addresses that. And it's happened, I'm originally from the Northeast. Okay. And what that says is that you have the ability to transport those weapons locked, et cetera, et cetera, with the ammunition aside, with, uh, with, I think they call it without, uh, with no undue delay or something like that. Okay. And a couple of those guys got hemmed up really hard in New England because they stopped to stay at a friend's house overnight with a weapon. Um, apparently, if you stop them for gas or any reasonable stop, such as you would with your aircraft, that sounds like it would fall directly into that federal legislation. I wish I could answer that, but I hate to fly. That's a good pilot. There are um, international regulations that prohibit carrying firearms in an aircraft. They have to be in an external lockable um, hold. I, I know that because I have an exemption in the UK. Well, that's commercial. Yeah, commercial. Okay. No. That's also private? It's private. Just any also. aircraft is. Not commercial, not private. In five minutes. <laughs> Thank you. I had a second um, question. Is that what that means? I thought you were rating. I thought you were rating. I thought you were rating. Yeah, it's with a story. These laws are pushing up the prices of um, firearms and ammunition. Yes. How is that going to affect your budgets? <laughs> I can say from our standpoint, the ammunition is getting harder and harder to get. I don't think the prices, because we have a yearly contract, say, okay, we're going to buy so many rounds for you. But the delivery is become, becoming scarcer and scarcer because of the, and we, we burn up a lot of ammunition, as you can imagine. But, and we're okay because we stockpile some, but I was about to say that's going to happen. No, you can't borrow. <laughs> <laughs> Adamson's, uh, you know, I buy ammunition from Adamson, and I think uh, they're six months to nine months out. So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Do you had to cut back any of your training because of ammo? Yeah. Yes, sir. I've been advised by one of my instructors to to use the same ammunition that the sheriff uses. Do you standardize your your ammunition? I use the bullets. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we use like the gold dot um, uh, ammunition. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, for uh, some of you'll have like the, the tactical federal. Uh, the loads and the type of uh, bullets. Uh, you don't use hollow point. Yeah. It depends on uh, depends on the situation, but now there is a difference between what I use for practice and what I use for duty. Uh, you know, as far as that goes. But. No, it can change, Ron. It can change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. I can tell you, Arvada doesn't use the same ammunition as Jefferson County. They use different brand and, and uh, grains and everything else. Hmm. Um, I know that uh, there's a lot of interest in Second Amendment issues, but also we'd advertise that we were going to ask you about some some of the marijuana. Oh, I wish you that's would. That's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger mess than this. <laughs> Is that going to take priority over the gun laws? No. <laughs> <laughs> I know a deputy from Teller County, and their facility is shared with uh, federal agencies. And because it's uh -huh. illegal on the federal side, but their facility is a state facility, it's creating issues. What, what are some of the issues you're seeing with the marijuana laws? What are the biggest things that are going to create problems for you? Well, the, the definition of what's a grower, what's a retailer, what's a, what's, what's the other term? Mm -hmm. you forgot. Dispensary. Dispensary. And that... Legislative task force is supposed, to, is supposed to give some direction uh, to law enforcement of what all this means, but we haven't seen anything yet, I don't believe. I honestly think, and if you're one of them, I apologize. I honestly think the voters were hoodwinked because they saw this thing oh, I can possess an ounce of marijuana, I'm going to vote for it, and then you got 10 or 11 pages of these other things that's going to do nothing but create a huge market for marijuana in the state of Colorado. We have a drug task force in Jefferson County, and they're already seeing the cartels are starting to use this as a dropping off point for their product, even though even though the, uh, we have to October, I believe, to, to fully realize the impact of, of uh, Amendment 64. Uh, again, it's... It's a federally against the law. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, doesn't federal law supersede oh, yes. state yeah. law? No, no, it does not. No, it yes, does it, not. Does. Yeah. it does. 
Uh, see, see these retailers? You know, you, they don't, even banks can't deal with them because they can't, banks will not take cash that violate federal law. Selling marijuana violates federal law. So what are you going to have? You're going to have a bunch of retailers with a lot of cash. We're not going to do it. They're going to have to launder it. They're going to have to launder the money to legally get it into a bank. That creates a whole new gambit of fraud and deception. That's true now with the medical marijuana, right? There's, there's no difference. Right. Yeah. Well, that's why uh, a lot of them are getting robbed for their cash because they don't get all the cash on them. Except the state got $60 million last year in taxes. He cares. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been gone for a long time, so I can't speak to it, but as I recall, Denver had a legal limit uh, of THC in your system for marijuana. They tried to pass one. You you talking about for the uh, driving? In, yes, in, in Denver. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't think Denver has it either. No. I don't know. I don't, Did, that's I, what they're working on. There was supposed to be a bill. I don't know what happened to it. I thought Denver to had a... Had it in Still, their, no. had it in their law. No, no, we did. They did, didn't did get passed. I don't. I don't think they have a. Uh, would it be a, an ordinance? I don't believe they have an ordinance in, in Denver for that. Not yet. Oh, okay. Is the only way to test for it uh, by a blood test, like blood alcohol level, THC? Yeah, but blood? you know we have drug blood blood recognition <laughs> experts that right. kind of. I mean, they're trained on how to diagnose. Again, you have to have probable cause to stop somebody based upon their driving habits. Like well, unless there's a lot of Doritos in the front seat. Well, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's part two. Part two. But yeah, no. the, the, the five nanograms are detected by blood. Okay. I think right now the biggest time, you've probably seen the cartoon that's out uh, where it shows the, uh, up on the border, and it shows the guy from Colorado selling the marijuana and the guy from Wyoming selling the bags. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I've been uh, wondering, uh, the Sheriff's Association, uh, uh, put your, uh, what do you call it, what you had to say about the gun business. How close was the vote? For, for the sheriffs? Yes. Oh, it was unanimous, unanimous, unanimous for the sheriffs. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, awesome. all, all the sheriffs. Yeah, I think, awesome. uh, yeah we, 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 we can. And the only thing that you have is there's 64 counties, there's 62 sheriffs. Denver, Broomfield, of course, have uh, banners of uh, part of public safety. Well, Denver uh, has a sheriff's department, don't they? They have a sheriff's department. They do not have a sheriff. Oh, they're trained. Yeah, they run a jail. It's run by uh, the director of public safety. Yeah. I can't remember. Gary? Gary Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Gary. Did I hear you right? You said it was unanimous? Yes. 62? All the sheriffs. 62? All 62 sheriffs. Court was. And the chiefs of police, was it unanimous? Their association, which is the uh, Colorado Association of Chiefs of Police, supported the bills. Unanimously? I don't know what they're okay. They have their own association. Well, that's going to be difficult to fight. No. Right. Do, doesn't the sheriff's departments collectively have more square miles than yeah. the <laughs> chiefs of police? <laughs> And we got more stars, right, first, too. Of all, <laughs> first, first of all, don't ever try and bring logic into the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> my, my bad, yeah. sorry. <laughs> I've talked to the chiefs of police in, in uh, uh, Jefferson County, and they're like this. I don't know how you going to enforce it. Why'd you support it? Well, our association did. Oh, wow. We'll do maybe uh, two more questions here, and we'll kind of start. Yeah, because I gotta have a beer. <laughs> <laughs> two more questions if we've got those. And then arrest yourself for drinking. I'll be at home. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought, you know, this is a great opportunity for you guys and for you guys to tell us kind of what are the biggest issues you see in Park County and Jefferson County, especially in these rural areas. Is there a, a particular type of crime or a particular type of activity that we need to, to look out for as residents up here? Biggest, the biggest problem in Jefferson County is Park County. I know why I call it Father Ted. <laughs> ours is, I think ours pretty much has been uh, burglary because of the, we have so many summer homes uh, and there's in such secluded areas. Yeah. Um, you know, like 2,200 square miles of what Park County is. Only 17,000 people, and uh, uh, 
what uh, Ted spends for uh, beer money, I spend. That's all my budget. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, uh, I mean, it's it's hard. I mean, we just and so we see a lot of that. DUIs is another thing that uh, we get a lot of. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. yeah, I. The Jeffco is much the same, except they have a huge population, especially mm -hmm. the south part of the county. Got you know, one of the largest unincorporated populations in, in, in Colorado. So we have the same we have the same issues as. A city does with juvenile crimes, you know, vehicle trespasses, burglaries, the robberies, homicide here and there. So, uh, you know, we try to focus in. We use our crime analysis to try to focus in on on pattern crime areas and then put our resources there. Because uh, unlike uh, the legislators, we can provide public safety. Yes. yes. One last question? Mike. Uh, have you noticed a big increase in thefts and firearms over the last several months? Good question. Only from gun smoke, gun shop. Actually, we have had a problem with that in some of our other burglaries actually before this came up. Um, and that was because uh, folks were coming up and they've had these cabins that they uh, only visit uh, you know, on the weekends or whatnot and they leave those. Uh, in the closet and not locked up, and so uh, I, so I guess that would be a biggie if pass along. Those folks need to, you know, either put them in a gun safe or take them back with them when you go back home. Um, actually, we've done a real good job though on, on getting uh, most of those uh, back to the right homes. Yeah. Uh, which is always good. I have real. Well, Sheriff, Sheriff Mink and Sheriff Wagner, thank you very much. For So the moral of this story is elections matter, and uh, so uh, you know I encourage you all to continue to stay engaged in this. Um, based on the response we had, we'll also continue to do um, Second Amendment issues for the next several meetings, and so um, we encourage you to come back for that. The uh, next speaker we have tonight is Jeff Wright. He's the author of Citizens Last Stand, Are You Ready? He's got books back on the back table. He's also going to be speaking again at the Art Block Party this Thursday. Um, but I'll let uh, Jeff kind of introduce himself. He is a he is from Colorado. He's now living in Idaho, I believe. And and uh, but uh, he'll tell you a little bit about his book, and and um, we can ask him some questions after that. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, obviously, there's going to be a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of issues that's going to come from the firearms issue. I did want to say a couple of things further up with regard to the three prong approach that's being taken with regard to the, the ballot in, uh, initiative, the initiated amendment is going to be one. Second is going to be test cases. Uh, the gentleman wants to get himself arrested. Okay, <laughs> it, 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 There's going to be test cases that are going to be set up so specifically as challenges to take through the court system and to initiate lawsuits. Um, the third is going to be targeted recalls uh, in specific and starting one of the first ones that's starting up is John Morse down there in, as the Speaker of the House down in Colorado Springs, because it's in an extremely weak district. You only require 6,800 signatures, uh, uh, valid signatures to uh, initiate a recall. He only won his last election by 300 votes, so he's highly vulnerable in a district with uh, 30,000 voters. Uh, in the last election, he only won by 300 votes, so he's highly vulnerable, and he knows it. Uh, it's gonna cr and that's going to create a lot of problems. Um, I think for this turnout is just tremendous, and this is one thing as I've started out, this is my fifth appearance in Colorado since I came back to what I consider my political home. My home is in Idaho. I was born and raised there, uh, graduated from school, started my career out there. I was lived here, though, for 26 years. Um, I was one of the original petitioners on Tabor. I collected the highest number of volunteer signatures that were collected, my family collected, and myself almost 5,000 signatures put Tabor on the ballot in 92. 
Um, and then we worked to get, I worked like a dog to get it passed with Douglas Spruce. And I worked with him since then to try and protect it from all of the attacks that have been made against it. Currently, the Independence Institute, and I, I'm proud to say from that effort, the Independence Institute has estimated that Tabor has saved the, the citizens of the state of Colorado, the taxpayers of the state of Colorado, between 11 and 13 billion dollars since its inception 20 years ago. It's an incredibly powerful piece of uh, uh, legislation and uh, as an amendment, and it should be and it should be highly protected. It's one of the most important. I'm trying to work on getting it passed in Idaho right now and getting it into several other states. Um, I will have I have a personal note too on Douglas Bruce. Uh, I've known the man for 20 years, and it, and, and knowing his mother, uh, 22, 23 years now, knowing his and knowing his mother while she was alive, she was the first one to tell me Douglas Bruce is probably um, not socially acceptable to a lot of people, but he knows exactly what it's what he was doing when it came to protecting the taxpayer's wallet in Colorado. I can also tell you, having been personally involved in this trial last year, that it was a sham by the Attorney General. He's going to absolutely win his appeal. There's probably 40 to 50 major reversible errors that took place in that trial. Um, and uh, he'll be fully exonerated and the state is going to look like fools for what they did to him. Well, how did I get here to write this book? Obviously, I've been politically active for a long time. How I came to that, though, um, I've been highly active the last seven years because I realized that um, almost 15 years ago that the Republic is in extreme jeopardy uh, due to things that I experienced uh, early in life and uh, through, the la uh, through from 1972 to 1995, uh, before, or 1993, I guess, before I became really politically active. Um, and the reason I wrote this book, The Citizen's Last Stand, I started the manuscript in 2011 because I, I, I anticipated, and the timing has turned out to be extremely good, exactly the point that is bringing your people into the room, into these rooms all over uh, um, the states of the United States, because um, I anticipated that the, the, the 2012 is going to be another bad election year for conservatives uh, and the Tea Party and Liberty Movement and Republicans. And uh, there needed to be something for the next stage of what's coming on all these different issues that are now coming to the fore right now. And in fact, several of the predictions I made are coming as true as we speak, and not only financially and fiscally and in the monetary system, but now here at the local level, and what you're seeing in state legislative initiative or state legislative um, uh, fiascos like we have going on here in Colorado today. And that's what made my wife and I make the decision to go back in Idaho. We don't have the problem you have here back in Idaho right now because 80, 83 of 105 legislators in our Capitol Dome are Republican. Yeah. A Democrat would commit suicide before he would have introduced the bills that have been introduced in this session. Mm -hmm. And I was at the Capitol today after my, my first presentation this morning, talking to the legislatures and listened to the third reading bills that are getting passed, and believe me, it's even... It's, uh, however bad you think it is, what's going on in the legislature, it's much worse than that. And, and a couple of people I've been uh, in different presentations have said, you're sugarcoating it. And I said, you're probably right to say it's as bad as it's ever been, not only here but in Washington, D.C. Um, I started my career as a technologist. I was recruited out of high school by the Naval Security Group and then eventually wound up in the National Security Agency. Um, uh, uh, doing um, in the intelligence business um, for six years and building collection systems overseas, monitoring the Soviets and the Chinese, um, engaging in a lot of advanced, very advanced technology, which led to my commercial career later on because um, basically I came away from after six years of the National Security <coughs> Agency and another six years as a um, defense systems contractor in complex systems. What brought me to Colorado was the Space Operations Center, which is now called Triver Air Base down in Colorado Springs. We built the first mission control platforms to um, and designed the monitor of the worldwide tracking and telemetry system um, for CSOC uh, and Triver Air Base. And a lot of other contracts I, led me to a, when I had, an, I had enough of the defense complex systems process, I went into uh, commercial contracting, building large-scale networks for the financial banking 
industrial and commercial company corporations, uh, mostly in the Fortune 500, which led me by the 90s to spend most of my time living in and out of New York while commuting from Colorado Springs, um, building financial networks for large Wall Street firms, about half of the Fortune 50 over the decade, and particularly concentrated in the last five years. Um, we built a massive number of systems, um, and by 2000 I realized that we were headed for a disaster because, um, and I started calling them weapons of derivatives, weapons of financial mass destruction about four years before Warren Buffett was ever quoted as saying that. But um, it became obvious to me by the end of the 90s that, because all we were being asked to build was large-scale derivative trading platforms, in 90, which, have, which, have, which have become the Tyrannosaurus Rex of, of what's coming in the next phase. Um, unfortunately, and, and what's going to take place is we're in, we're in the low period between the first dip and the second dip, which is going to compound our political problems with the fiscal and financial, uh, primarily the fiscal shenanigans you see right now are, are highly predictable and easy to assess where they're going to go. And I go through those analysis and assessment to kind of give you an idea of how this whole framework is put together and how it's going to come apart and what we're going to have to do at the state and local level to protect ourselves. The last five chapters of the book basically deal with the issues from the state level on up. And the sheriffs, I have one, I was going to tell them. Chapter 17, they're like especially, because chapter 17 discusses the resta restoration of the constitutional county sheriff, which everybody is coming now aware of is so important that the sheriff be uh, the, the lead law enforcement officer, and they do it in a constitutional manner in order to stop these intrusions, not only from the federal government, but from their states, the unnecessary federal intrusion. And it does intrusion. And it doesn't just surround guns. We have, a, we have a whole bill of rights there. There's all the different rights, and all the rights have to be protected. Everybody concentrates on the guns right now, but I guarantee you're going to see that this, what needs to go on and what's going to become very evident soon is that it's going to involve a lot of other issues of rights that, that the people need to protect other than just guns. And so all those things together is what I put into the book along with my 20 years of activism here in Colorado because once we passed Tabor we found out that, oh guess what, they're going to continue to attack it forever. So we've spent the last 20 years, you know, what I usually tell people is that Douglas Bruce gets all of the publicity and the, and the subpoenas. I only get the subpoenas. <laughs> it, it's, it's been a really crazy, it, it's unbelievable what has gone on. And unfortunately, we have a Republican Attorney General who is leading this attack because they want to destroy Douglas Bruce so that he can destroy Tabor. I guarantee you, and it's, going, it's coming from both the left and the right, we have as many problems, we have as many problems in the Republican Party in some ways that we have in the Democratic Party. And people have got to start realizing and being objective. That's why the title, or the, the cover, has the, is the symbolism that a friend of mine developed, right? This is the red-blue wall that exists, and this is the individual busting up through that wall. Because it's the, it's the individual citizen that has to take control of this republic again. Otherwise, we're going to lose it, and we're going to lose it for all the, the reasons and the, um, and the analysis that I put into this book. What I, my goal was is to take things from about 20 different books you can read on government and politics, and based on my experiences and my background in these areas through the intelligence industrial, the military industrial complex, through the commercial and financial and banking and industrial industry, because to build networks and technology platforms for all these companies, you have to know exactly how they work. And when you see how they work, you go, oh my gosh, some of these, some of these are not working very well for a lot of reasons. And one of them is the hyper what I call the hyper-regulatory state. We are reaching a point of hyper-regulatory-ism that is destroying our ability to produce in this country. And until we, ta we address that, and we address it starting from the ground up. You know, one of the f phrases I like to use in the book is, how do you expect to solve the problems of the government that's 2,500 miles away when you don't even have control of the government that's right out your front door? 
And that's what we have to do first. If we do this, we get control of our local and state government, that will start to take control of what's going on in Washington, D.C. And you do it with candidates, but you do it with candidates that actually have the information and understanding that they need to govern with on behalf of the people. And it starts with economics and free markets, it starts with natural law, and it starts with the Declaration and the Constitution. I have stood in front of groups all over the Western United States, and the first question I always ask, and I oh, left it back there on the table, I pull out my little Constitution. <coughs> How many people believe in the Constitution? And usually every far arm in the room goes up. And then I say, How many people have read it in the last five years? And usually most arms stay up. And I say, How many read it in the last three years? Some arms start to drop. Two years, one year, six months. And by the time you get to six months, most of the arms in the room have dropped. Well, that's one part of the problem. And then I ask the killer question. How many people in the room have ever read their state constitution? <coughs> ever. The state constitution is more important than the federal constitution when you understand the nature of the republic. And the, and the, and the lack of that understanding is what's mo a lot of our problem of how this republic was supposed to work. So when we repair that, we automatic from the ground up, we automatically repair the bottom of the system, which is what takes control, again, of what was called the top of the system, but which is actually the subservient government to the states, which is the federal government. So with that synopsis, I think you understand this is, this is a gloves-off analysis. It's not going to make a lot of friends in the establishment Republican, and it's definitely not going to make any friends in the... Uh, Democrat, or the Democratic Party, but it is going to tell. It does tell the truth, and it goes does get to the point exactly. So with that, I just take any questions. And books are available on Amazon, or if you want to buy them here, they're they're a dollar off the Amazon place. Plus, you don't have to pay for the shipping. And it will be also besides the R Block Party on Thursday, 28th on April 6th. I'll be at the American Experiment, and I also am combining that. They gave me. Uh, uh, a full hour and a half, so I'm going to do one of my sub-presentations to the book, which is about natural law, the Declaration, and the Constitution, and how all those things fit together, to and how it's supposed to work versus how it's working right now. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Yes? So being an action-oriented group, if we mm -hmm. had 20 people in here that wanted to get together, what could we <coughs> go out and do next week that's going to... and. And kind of how does that fit into your? Well, the work? first thing is yeah. The first thing is always, the first thing is always don't don't go bang aim ready, okay. Uh, when, when you when 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 you get ready to fire off, it's just like the, the group that wanted to start the ballot initiative. They want to announce. They said no no no. Doing ballot initiatives for 20 years in this state, first of all, until you have your petitioners lined up, until you have. Every, your language set, you've gotten through, you've, you've gotten through the initiated, the initiative review, and all these things. You have your petitioners actually lined up and ready to go. You don't announce anything of any of any consequence, right? You have to first get yourselves properly organized. You have to have the foundation of education to understand at the at the very bottom what your relationship with your government is. What, your, uh, what the functions of the government are, you know, where, how does the city, you know, is a home rule city versus a home rule county versus, how does, how does the state actually work? How is it supposed to work? How do these things, you know, and, and you do that through educating yourselves and each other, to, and you can do it pretty quickly in many ways, right? It, uh, and one of the ways is buy my book. <laughs> And it, it's kind of, like I said, it's, I'm trying to short circuit this because we don't have a lot of time here. There's a very, very big sense of urgency. You know, I started this a long time ago, 15 years, and of course, up until about four years ago, I was insane, trying to explain to people what was coming. You know, when I left Wall Street and ran out of New York like my hair was on fire, <laughs> tried to tell all of my friends and relatives and everybody I could, you better be prepared for what's coming in the in financially in the next decade. And they looked at me and they go, Jeff, you're crazy. My house is going up. My, you know, uh, my 401k is going through the roof. And I'm going, talk to me in 2010. Of course, now, you know, by 20, 2008, now they're calling me up going, what do I do? And I'm trying to explain, you know, well, now you need to take these steps. But I'm saying, these are things we should have been doing 10 years ago. 
Well, we've got lost 10 years and we need to catch up really quick. And that's unfortunate, the learning curve is, that, is at that level. But it needs to happen. And it's got to happen quickly. And the first thing is, is I, would, I would more than double Lauren's commitment goal. Friends, the Republic is in tr deep trouble here. And everybody seems to still be going, oh, I don't know. The convenience, of the, the, the convenience of blissful ignorance is coming to an end shortly. Okay, we're hitting, it's going on in Europe right now. They're, they're hitting the point. I'm going to be discussing some of the financial stuff going on in Cyprus on a radio interview in about a week. Um, <clears throat> somewhere, which I can't even, like I said, I'm losing track of my schedule right now. But these things are... Um, they're fast accelerating in ways that a lot of people don't understand. And whatever false recovery that we're sensing right now, it isn't real. Okay, it's, it's, a, it's a mirage that's going to end soon. We're going to go into the second downlift. And so people have to get committed and they have to start moving. Yes? Go ahead. I'll get you next. Um, I'm just, <clears throat> I agree with all that you're saying. No, please in don't. Total. No, <laughs> I do agree. I think you're exactly right. but. I'm a little bit confused yes. about one point that you made, okay. and I have, the question I have is, uh, I agree that all ten of the Bill of Rights need to be protected, mm -hmm. but if you have a populace that is unarmed or disarmed, how in the world do you do that? I, I hear that from, from my gun friends all the time. I hear that, well, if you don't have the Second Amendment, I'll tell you, what good is the Second Amendment if every one of your other rights has been obliterated? That's okay. the point of the Second Amendment. Right, but the thing is, is that we have the Second Amendment, there's 90 million gun owners and 320 million firearms in this country, and we're losing all our rights anyway. So what's, that's it's because, not working. That's because people don't understand that we are the militia. It, with it, right, and that, that's another one of my training courses, getting people to understand the difference between the general, the special, and the private militia, and how they actually work instead of what this distorted view is that gets put through the, the media about and, what a militia actually is. And what you said, well, what they distort it to is to their own benefit. But what you said about the sheriffs, they are the lead component of the militia to take back state and local governments when they're out of control. Yeah, they call them sheriff's auxiliary or, sh or the sheriff's posse and several other. But there's also, there is also a, a, just the general militia itself because the sheriff's posse that's that's one of the special militias, okay? That's that's a different category than the general militia, okay? You still have the general militia, whether you have any number of special militias that are organized by the sheriff, <coughs> organized by the governor as the National Guard, or whatever. But my, my point is, is if you're disarmed, what can you do? I, exactly. But... We spend, we spend a lot of time focusing only on the Second Amendment without looking at all the other rights, and then they're going away while we're focusing on the Second Amendment. Well, and if we could, we'll take uh, three, three more questions here. Okay. Uh, yes. I'll just put you on the spot. I've been paying a little bit of attention to what's going on in the economy. $16.6 .6 trillion in debt, uh, $5 trillion on, on, the, on the deficit, and add Obamacare. That's going to add another $6 trillion possibly on that. Got a 600 billion plus uh, trade deficit going on. We're printing money like crazy. The uh, false sense of security with the stock market rising. Should I cash my 401k in or, or uh, hold, you know, invest into prepping? I would highly or? recommend that you reduce all of your paper exposures to the maximum extent, and do what I what I call it. These are categories of investment. They're not literal. What I call have been calling for the last decade the four G's. What I first started telling my relatives about. Guns, ground, groceries, and gold. What those are is categories, okay? Guns, anything in personal security, self-defense, look at, I mean, if, if somebody followed my, on Smith & Wesson, you know, stock, they would have, like, soared five years ago for what they were, right, to five years later and all the other arms manufacturers. Uh, so these are categories of investment. They're not literal. Ground, real estate, farmland, anything, anything solid ground, right? Um, uh, we, gotta, we should probably wait in residential real estate until the uh, until the next dip goes, because we're we're in for the net, regardless of what they say. The only reason there's improvement in housing is because they're still holding millions of foreclosures in real estate-owned properties off, out of the foreclosure business and off the market. They're not processing it, millions. Um, <clears throat> groceries, commodities, basic commodities, right? Anything that goes into essentials. 
that people need everyday services and essentials that people need everyday from medical items, health care, groceries, and so vegetables, food, farm products, those things. Um, and of course, precious, precious metals. This, if you look, you know, there's really been nothing happened in the stock market. This is really funny the way that they put this because to be at the same, the same value that the stock market was at in 1999 when it hit 11.5, today it would have to be 15.3 to be at the same value, okay, based on inflation. I mean, all these misnomers about, you know, how this stuff works. And even at its even as 2000, 2006 or 2007 peak at 14, whatever, you have to be at 15.8 to exceed that one. Okay, so it's not it's not even what it was. It's, we're going through what Japan went through. In '89, their stock market, the, the Nikkei hit 39,000, just under 39,000. Well, it's it's 11,000 today, and after you adjust for inflation, it's 17 percent of the value it was. And Japan is sinking out of sight fast. They're losing a million people in population every year. And Europe, what's going on, uh, well, like I said, that's, these are whole things, whole stories in and of themselves. All I'm saying is, is that people have got to get out of this complacency. And they stop, have to stop listening to what's being fed by the, by the mainstream media because there's so much garbage in it. It's almost unbelievable at this point. And I have to start getting, you know, we have to start thinking for ourselves taking care of ourselves, worrying about our neighbors our, our, and our state. Because if we don't protect our states, the federal, we're going to go into that black hole called the federal government implosion. And that fiscal abomination, it's, been, it's so much worse than most people imagine, you know, when you get a look at it from the inside. I spent a lot of years going into D.C. and working government networks and inside. Any it's, other questions for Jeff? It's a mess. Yeah. Yes? Do you... Do you have a website? Um, well, my web guy tells me it's still under construction. <laughs> well, you said you're speaking on the radio and you don't know your yeah. schedule. Do you have a way to update your current talks or no, not, podcasts? Not yet. Uh, yeah, my web guy is behind schedule. I'm, the book was published in January, and he said he'd be ready in February. With some, and I'm, I'm out in front of his headlights right now, so on the website. Uh, but it should be up shortly. It's the citizenslaststand.com. Okay. Obviously, like I said, the book is on Amazon <coughs> for $17.99 plus shipping, and I sell it directly and provide signed copies for um, um, $17 uh, cash or check. I'm working. I, I'm waiting for my square card to come in. Um, and um, if you, like I said, if you want to hear more, a longer version of this talk, uh, come to either our block party or the American Experiment over in uh, Littleton on the 6th of April, and uh, I'll, give, I'll give more on the information. So that I think you, you have it, so. um, Dave has it, I guess. Yes, I think Dave has it. So, if anybody's yes, interested in the talk. You can write talks. through the, uh, you can just email me through the uh, 285 uh, Tea Party website. Um, you can find, just go to the about information, uh, uh, to the information about contact us, and um, there'll be an email address there, and you can email us, and I can get you connected with Jeff. So I thank you for your time, and I look forward to working with you all. Uh, a couple of quick, quick things before we go. Elections matter. <laughs> Elections definitely matter, okay? Um, and, and this group is about action. If you're interested in the 285 um, activist group, uh, please let us know and we'll get you involved in that. I mean, uh, coming here and hearing all this information is great, but if you go home and do nothing about it, we're not going to change things. So please also, if you're not on our mailing list, stop by the back table over here and make sure that you leave your name and email address or put it on the pieces of paper, hopefully everyone had those in their seats, and drop it off or just leave it in your seat. Thank you for coming, we Thank appreciate you. your time.